A warmly welcome to the online festival Driving the Human. My name is Sabine Faller and I am an artist and media educator at ZKM and I will accompany you today through the section Habitat. To get closer to the concept of Habitat, I give you a little insight into the idea of the political climate exhibition Critical Zones, a thought experiment, which is currently shown analog and virtual at the ZKM and which is co-curated by the French philosopher Bruno Latour and his team. Through the exhibition, we try to raise awareness that we are living on a thin, fragile and highly complex layer. Latour describes this as a critical zone. It is the habitat upon which all life on earth depends. In the eyes of Latour, humanity should reconsider its previous and common images of the earth and better rethink and look for a, planet, uh, for a place to land down on earth. In this talk, we will discuss this idea of landing, but also deal more deeply with the circumstances and conditions that are making our world to a territory we'd rather like to escape or how we and our children can inhabit. The last version I personally prefer. So in this panel, on my side, three exciting guests who I would like to introduce to you in a moment and with whom we will discuss in the upcoming hour about their different perspectives, positions and ideas. Of course, we also want to get into touch with you. Ask your questions in the Telegram chat and in between the last, let's say, 10 minutes of this talk, um, around 6.15, the discussion will be open for your questions and co-moderated by my colleague, Barbara Kjolvasa. And now I will introduce our guest shortly. Bonjour, ça va? I will start with you, Alexandre Monin. You are a scientific director, a professor in the media field and have worked intensively on strategies and designs for the Anthropocene. For the think tank of the SHIFT project, you co-wrote the report towards digital sobriety about energy transition. What are, in your eyes, the urgencies of our time and how should we react? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, yes, I think with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, England first, then Europe quickly shifted from what a French author Benoit Davion calls a solar metabolic regime uh, where we're receiving energy from the sun to a mining metabolic regime, extracting energy from underneath the critical zones from places we do not inhabit. It's a reversal of the Copernican revolution instead of shifting from geocentrism to heliocentrism in terms of representation. Europeans did just the opposite as regards their modes of living. This is how we made the globe of globalization that Latour speaks of tangible, a second nature that is also a ruin future-wise. And now we need proper knowledge, both practical and theoretical to dismantle it because we depend in the short run on what is threatening us in the longer run. Okay, thank you, Alexandre. Frederick, we go on with you. Frederick et Tuati, because your world is the theater. You are a theater director and a historian of literature and modern science. Your latest book, Terraforma, describes the mapping of um, modern science and your, um, yeah, your, the world through science. And at the same time, invites us to look at the world from different perspectives by making the undergrounds visible. What do you think prevents us in our time to follow this invitation that you have described in your book? Well, first of all, Sabina, thanks a lot for your invitation. Um, and what prevents us? Uh, I guess it's, it's a question of gaze, as Alexandre was saying. We are very much used to look at the world from above, from um, what I could call a fictional or technical point of view, which is far away in the cosmos. And in fact, I have spent some years studying this historical making of, of the point of view of, of this gaze, which has created beautiful images, images that we all cherish, that we love, you know, the, the blue marble and this kind of images. But the problem is that the gaze, this gaze, as Bruno Latour um, has, has mentioned many times, this gaze doesn't allow us 
to grasp the complexity or the urgency of, of our time, especially the intricate relationship between human, non-human and technical artifacts. So if we indeed would like to try to lend without crushing, as, as Latour says, and as he invites us to do in, in the beautiful exhibition I was lucky enough to, to see actually, we need, we need to renew our gaze, we need to change our point of view, we need to find new ways of representing the earth we live on, not from above as in ancient cartography, but from inside the critical zone. And this is such renewal of our images that I have tried to do to imagine with my colleagues, Alexandra and Axel, in the book you mentioned, Terraforma. And maybe I'd like to share with you some of those images today. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Frederick. And we go on with Guillaume Pitron. You are a journalist, author, and documentary filmmaker, and you deal with the dark sides of globalization, as in your book, The Rare Metal Wars. How do you assess the current situation? Is it a crash or a landing approach? Guillaume. Thanks, Sabine. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I think to answer your question, I'd like to pursue what has been said by Alexandre and Frédéric. Uh, we all share this common belief that uh, the more we are going into a technological world, which sometimes uh, actually brings us the approach or the understanding that we are able to live more dematerialized to separate us from what makes the maturity of the world. In fact, the more we go into that technological direction, the more actually we have to dig into the ground for actually making this dematerialized digital world possible. We speak about the cloud all the time, the cloud in which you put your videos and pictures, and this looks like a place which doesn't exist, as if you were out of this world, but actually to build the cloud, you have to dig even more deeply to make this uh, cloud possible because our world really much depends upon resources. And that's my, my, my area of study to actually link our uh, connected lives and to connect them for real to actually what's under the ground. And the critical zone is obviously, uh, you know, this thin layer that is 100 meters under our feet in which we have for the last uh, thousands of years and in the last centuries and more and more in the last decades and this zone that we will even more uh, exploit and more uh, look into for extracting these resources that we are very much depend, uh, usually depending on and the more we look into the solar world as as uh, solar energy as Alexon said actually the more we'll have to dig into the ground to catch the power of the sun and to turn it into electricity so this is this kind of paradox that I try to address and uh, I'm sure we are going to have further exchange on that. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for your short introduction and your statements. And now we'll, we will open up the round of questions. Um, but before that, Bruno Latour has stated that at the time of globalization, we need a kind of complete restart of our thinking and acting to make the world habitable again. And therefore, all these contemporary metaphors have become important, sustainable, durable, breathable, and lifeable. And with this thought in uh, my mind, I'd like to start with you, Frederick. Um, as a historian, you look, and let me be a little bit dramatic, at the ruins of our former civilizations. And yeah, actually now we are in the middle of a new crisis. Lockdown has shown us how vulnerable humanity is. Frederick, with your knowledge of uh, the past, what is our story so far and where are we going to land if we are going on like this? Well, historians can't say much about the future, uh, I'm afraid, but um, uh, it's true that we can, we can try to find patterns or, or, or things to help us. And actually, as, a, as I said, I've been very interested in a major cosmological shift in history, the one that has been named the scientific revolution. And in many ways, it uh, reminds us, it can help us maybe to understand what's going on to us, especially on this question of ruins. Uh, I just want to quote the great astronomer Kepler, uh, which I, whom I like a lot, and he was um, using, like us, the metaphor of ruins, which is, first of all, an architectural metaphor. And he described at the beginning of his great book, Astronomia Noah, 
a cosmos in ruins. And he set himself and the people of his time the great and exciting task of rebuilding an entirely new cosmos from these ruins. And interestingly for us, I think, this task of rebuilding from the ruins was partly made through fiction, through narrative. Um, and those narratives, I try to study them in my book, Fiction of the Cosmos. This is um, a, a completely new vision of the cosmos. And what is interesting, I think, for us is that it was not enough to use scientific and technical tools to rebuild the cosmos. It was necessary, but not enough, not sufficient. They also needed new stories. The kind of stories they were telling were stories of a break. And what I find interesting in the people I read, like Bruno Latour, but also Anna Singh, but also Baptiste Morisot, um, or, you know, Descola, you know, all those people, the kind of stories they use today, the kind of stories we need um, are uh, stories about, you know, um, um, trying to, to be careful, that stories about precaution, about attention. Uh, there are stories about, okay, what to do with the ruins precisely? Can we can we um, make them into habitable spaces, which is what Anat Singh is doing, for instance. So I just want to share with you, and that will be the last two minutes of this little answer. I just want to share with you um, a few images from that book, Terraforma, um, that basically, can you see it? So, which really tries to show um, how to represent this critical zone. So for instance, this first image is exactly what Guillaume was saying about how did we dig into, uh, into the critical zone little by little. Mm -hmm. And what we discover then is a, a very, very strange thing. Um, how can we change our gaze so that this critical zone is visible? So of course, it's not only about new stories, it's also about new images. Um, and there's, an old, there's an, another little uh, map I would like to share with you. It's, it's about ruins. Now that we have ruins, how can we make them habitable again? And this is what this last map of, of the book called Memories tries to do, is to transfer uh, a negative sign, which is a ruin, like uh, you know a nuclear plant, um, or um, kind of waste. How do you transfer waste into something habitable? So it's this kind of, of strange compass that we that we build together. So just to share with you a few a few glimpses at, at Terraforma, but to me it's an interesting fact that we should mix new narratives and new images in order to try to land, so to speak. We need maps to try to land. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this uh, insight in uh, Terraforma. Maybe we stay um, talking about imagination, imagination of the future. Guillaume, you as an author, um, is it easier to imagine the end of the world than to create new narratives and positive stories for a living? What do you think? I think it's somehow easier for many people to imagine the end of the world. I think so. Uh, you know, we have in France a very strong movement. I mean, I don't know if it's a strong movement, but it's a kind of a, um, uh, an important movement, uh, which we call uh, collapsologists. Those uh, researchers, whom I know actually, um, who uh, you know, tend to see in, also in the past, good arguments for saying that we are going nowhere and that our civilization as it is, uh, and the globalization as it goes actually will end up in, uh, in breaking up, breaking up our civilization. And this collapsologist people somehow become eschatologist people. It's not only that they say that this is gonna be the end of a system which should be replaced by another one, but there is somehow a religious thinking in this way of, 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 of speaking about the end of our system. It, it, it goes until the point where some might believe that actually uh, we're going to disappear and 7 billion people will uh, die in a couple of uh, decades. And we have a former ministry in France uh, who is very much into this and very much part of this collapsologist uh, movement. 
I don't believe in that. And uh, I speak under the control of Frederick who is the historian, but I remember reading a book by, uh, reading, reading a book by a French historian whose name is Luc Marie. And Luc Marie wrote a book and he said, how many times did we announce the end of the world in, his, in the history since the end of Rome? since uh, the end of antiquity. And the end of history he recounted was announced 182 times. And we're still here. <laughs> so I believe we are somehow in the announcement of the 183rd end of history, whether it is the end of a system or the end of humans on the planet, I don't know. Once again, it depends on people on how they understand that. But I believe there's kind of a lack of imagination to say, well, you know, it can't go further than that. That being said, this is also the, 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 the uh, um, how can I say, announcing that is also a, a reason of, of the resilience that we have shown for the last decades and last centuries and, and last thousands of years. The more we tend to understand the risks that surround us, that surround that actually may impact our civilization, the more we tend to react to that. And we tend to take good decisions in order to avoid such scenarios. And uh, I'm very much uh, into optimist. I very much believe in resilience. And in this uh, context, I, I believe in technologies, technologies for actually finding the solutions to the huge challenges that we are facing. We're facing huge challenges and technologies will be part of this. In the digital sector, in the energy sector, we speak about electricity storage at the next, as, as a future coming soon, probably, uh, you know, uh, innovation that we change our approach to our energy challenges. We cannot store this electricity very well today, but we're, we're making so many progresses that maybe tomorrow we'll be able to have electricity storage technologies, which will allow us to store for years, uh, you know, the uh, electricity brought by sun rays in one sort of farm in the Sahara desert for only one or two days. And that might change completely, you know, our uh, uh, challenges we are facing in terms of how do we address our electricity and energy needs without impacting too much environment. And I, I want to believe in this. On the other hand, having imagination means thinking that these kind of technologies will not save us and will not make everything easy uh, in the future. And maybe there is a bit of, uh, of um, I try to find the word in English, uh, paresse in French, but maybe there is a bit of uh, easy thinking, easy way of thinking to believe that, you know, we just got to wait for the next technologies to solve all the issues that we are facing, which actually will be saved and will be, f uh, f uh, you know, uh, fixed by uh, uh, addressing political challenges, social challenges, uh, ethical challenges, philosophical challenges. And I just want to finish with that one example. I, I love to work on circular economy for our future in order to, you know, use less resources in the future. That's one of the big challenges we face. And circular economy is about recycling techniques. It's about eco-conception, eco-design techniques. It's about technologies for actually, uh, you know, reusing you know, the materials as many times as we can. And we start, when we start to go into that direction, we realize that it's about bringing tech, uh, companies together, people to speak to each other together, to find supply versus demand, to make them coincide each other. And at some point, it's nothing about technology. It's all about reorganizing a new way of living together. And that's a real proof that the future cannot only be relying on technologies and that it's all about humans. Mm -hmm. Guillaume, at this moment, I'd like to um, ask Alexandre, because you are our technology expert uh, in this panel, um, do, you, do we really need a life-saving utopia in, yeah, in technology or not? And how would it be designed in your eyes? Well, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, this question. Uh, it, it's really good because I think we will have lots of disagreements, which is always good in a panel when yeah. not everyone is, is okay you know, to share the same opinion. So I'm really happy about that. Um, if I may answer your question by following up on what has been said uh, earlier, I think that will be a, a nice way of doing it. Um, re regarding ruins, I think it's, it's interesting to um, have maybe 
another understanding of ruins that the, the one we generally have, which is a very picturesque or picturesque, uh, you know, romantic ruins, even Nazi ruins, uh, the Nazi has a theory of ruins, which was very well known, you know, they want to leave uh, ruins after them. That was kind of their project, it was a really crazy project. But anyway, it was very central. Uh, but there's another understanding of ruins. It's the understanding of uh, Walter Benjamin, um, who said that the real ruin is the bourgeois city. Uh, and the bourgeois city was actually running, up and running, you know, it was developing and all that. And I think we have to understand that the real ruin is not uh, the decaying ruin. Of course, there are uh, ruins and those we identify, but the real ruin is uh, what in our current system is currently working, but really soon will no longer work uh, that well and is not adapted for the conditions of the Anthropocene. So things we take for granted, supply chain, uh, where we get our food from, um, where we get our energy from, all those systems, we take them for granted, but actually they're ruins. And this is uh, the threatening aspect of things, the, the very foundations of this second nature we do inhabit uh, are really frail. This is something that's a crisis like the uh, coronavirus crisis is showing as well. Uh, if we stop everything, how do people survive? where do we get our food from and questions like that and problems of energy that we are going to have in France uh, during the winter, uh, especially this year. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a taste of what is, what is coming. So I think it's interesting to understand the ruin behind what a colleague of mine calls the cliche, uh, the ruin in what seems to be functioning, what seems to be, uh, you know, uh, an example of modernity, an example of well-functioning technology. Uh, uh, thereupon lies the true uh, ruin, which is, of course, even more difficult to understand and to decipher. Um, and, and regarding uh, 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 religion and the role of technology, um, it's interesting. I have been studying myself, the uh, collapsologist movement in France, um, uh, I, I was actually one of the publishers with Cyprien and Laurent Salah of a, a, um, a special issue of Multitude, the, the journal, uh, precisely on the collapse, on the collapse movement. Um, it, it, it was uh, said by uh, Guillaume that it's some sort of religious movement. Of course, you can uh, 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 ascribe to people who believe that uh, my, this might be the end of the world, a kind of eschatological belief. But what I found out was that rather these were people who were um, dealing with these topics without any religious anchoring, which might be a problem as well, without you know, the means to understand, deconstruct those religious um, concepts, uh, uh, myths, um, and because they were cut from this tradition that created more problems than it, than it solved. But I, I do believe that the idea that technology will save us is has religious has this idea of the end of the world it's the belief in progress it's the belief that technology has all the uh the answers and for reasons i will probably um describe later i believe that that is not that is not the case which is also something very different difficult to understand because we have been projecting this future full of technologies and now maybe we have to renounce it now maybe this future is asynchronous with regards to our current situation. That is very difficult because we have trained people to understand that they were and they have been entering uh, a digital revolution or something like that. And you say this is going to be an aborted revolution. Well, it's kind of a betrayal. Everything had to change according to this revolution, and now it's not the case because the Anthropocene is more encompassing as a change than the digital revolution. That's that's. Difficult and unacceptable somehow. So we have to deal with this situation. And, and last point, maybe just, and I will be able to, to say a few words about that later, about um, narratives. It's true that narratives are very strong in lots of thinking. Uh, Frédéric have been mentioning and I've seen uh, Baptiste Moiseau and others. Uh, it's also very strong in the collapsology movement. Uh, a lot of people are talking about narratives are trying to build new narratives and things like that. But we have to be wary that the one strong narrative today, and this is something we see in the collapse movement, 
uh, which is kind of uh, sundering the collapsed movement to house, is uh, the QAnon narratives. That's a very strong narrative nowadays, uh, which is pure conspiracy theory and things like that. But you know, there is a dark aspect of narratives and narrations. And I think right now we're dealing with these aspects. So we, we, we should be much more wary, I think, of narratives because those people that will uh, impose their narratives are not the researchers we like, but rather crazy conspiracy theorists. Mm. So we were talking a lot about ruins, Alexandre. Um, so what what do you what do you all think is the learning out of this? Uh, how can we create or what is necessary for making a new modern world to be possible? To concentrate not on these uh, dark sides you have um, said. Do you, do, I, I, do you want me to? It's uh, who wants to jump in? <laughs> Alexander, if you, if you like, go on. Please. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the problems we have is um, directly related to the issue at stake of habitability. Um, we are wondering whether we should, um, I think you said something, something like that, uh, Sabine, um, design habitability or that there are reflections about that. But I think precisely the problem is that we have been designing habitability and, and, and then we inherit the situation we're in because of that. We have, and, and that was somehow part of, of the progress, of the real progress we made in terms of our conditions on earth, which was really harsh uh, before. Uh, we have been designing and has a French theoretician of design has been saying, uh, improving the habitability of earth. That's Alain Finelli. And actually he, um, he defines design as being an effort to improve the habitability on earth. Uh, but this is precisely what we have been doing throughout technology, our economic growth, our sustained but not sustainable economic growth, this shift from a uh, heliocentric regime to a geocentric extractivist uh, 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 regime. Um, and that is, of course, part of the problem. So how can we decenter uh, from this uh, perspective of designing habitability to understand how we may uh, find a place on Earth with other beings that also design, actually are the true designers of the habitability of Earth. I mean, plants are doing much more than humans uh, with this regards uh, and other, you know, other beings uh, in the sea and, and elsewhere. Uh, so how can may we find a place and, and, and leave a place for other people? So also going again, for a very long time. Frederick, maybe you want to jump in. Uh, we were talking about reconnection. 
with all kinds of livings. And I think uh, you have a good insight uh, what this could mean, especially maybe for a new concept for the future. Yeah, well, I, I could I could answer and prolong what Alexandre was saying with, with uh, yet another little picture um, of uh, Terraforma, just as a as a way to to I don't know if you see that it's uh, and it's also a way to 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 give the floor to Guillaume who has worked much more than me on on this question of resources, but. Um, just to try to answer the question of habitability, I mean, I was very struck by what, what Alexandra said, uh, this strange double in inheritance that we need to do from the past and from the future that will not happen. I really like the way you you phrased that. Um, the, the, the way we tried to, to represent that in Terraforma was in this strange little um, four little uh, bubbles that you see, we try to represent the way in which we inherit precisely the idea of resources. How do we habit, inhabit? How do we find resources? Uh, how have we found resources up to now? Well, we, we did that by making some kind of biome, ventouse kind of uh, bubbles in which you just take everything from a place. So what you see on this strange little map is uh, um, a forest, uh, a mine, um, uh, a chemical valley near Lyon, uh, and uh, the, the fourth one is it's a plant. So basically you have four typical ways of extracting resources, which means that you just you just take everything to the ground and completely until it's basically a dead land, which can't be inhabited anymore. Um, and, and the reason why we have worked a lot on that is that because Alexandra and Axel, my two colleagues on Terraforma, they are young architects and most of the projects they have been asked to work on in the last 10 years are projects to re-inhabit um, industrial, technological, uh, ruined territories, basically. Um, so they they have been very much obsessed by that, and they and 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 they wanted to represent this typical um, process of of extractivism. Uh, so of course, um, I I'm not an economist, and I have no idea of how to how to get rid of that. But it was important for us to represent in a certain way this. Um, crazy way of, of, of using land until it's dead, basically. And I pass you the floor, Guillaume, because that's your topic. Talking about resources now, Guillaume? The topic. Sure, I, I can, I, I can, I'm, I'm very impressed by what, um, what, what Fedek has shown us. I had never seen this, uh, this, uh, this representation of um, of um, what we extract from the ground and what we do to, to the earth. Uh, usually is a, you know, when you used to see that because in our countries, maybe maybe Germany can be an exception because it's still a very much industri industrialized country. There's a part of the industry in your growth, I mean, in your, in your economy is twice as big as it is in our country in France. I think it, in, in Germany, it's 25% of uh, the GDP of Germany, but it's like 12% in France. So, um, you know, our industries are away from cities and we have no mines anymore. We used to, but we just closed them because we just don't want to have the dirt, uh, you know, out of these mines. And usually we send these uh, extraction activities thousands of kilometers from where we are, from where the consumer is, that actually, then actually we just don't even know what's going on. We have made these impacts invisible. We don't see them anymore. And uh, that's why uh, these pictures are impressive uh, because it brings us back to the very consequence of uh, our ways of living or of our choices as consumers. But the more we create a distance between uh, what we do as consumers and how it impacts the technosphere, 
as uh, Alexandre was mentioning this word when we prepared this, this, in this panel, uh, the less it will be easy to, to get a sense of that. I just want to finish with just one, one, one calculation that has been made by a French researcher, Olivier Vidal, uh, a couple of years ago. His uh, conclusions were published in Nature, in the review Nature. I think it was back in 2016 or 17. And he tried to figure out how much uh, minerals we would need for the 30 next years, for all the needs we are having right now for digital technologies, green technologies. I'm not talking even about this, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, primary commodities such as, uh, uh, such as oil or even food commodities. I'm just talking about metals and minerals. And we are uh, growing at such, a, at such a rate that actually we're gonna have to extract from the ground in the next 30 years as many minerals than all the minerals we have extracted for the last 60,000 years. So since uh, human is human, since, since sapiens is sapiens, and we're gonna use and extract more for the next 30 years, as much at least, than for the last 60,000 years. So that gives you an, an idea of uh, the kind of impact it can have just to have this figure. We still feel today in some part of the world the impacts of Roman times extraction activities. We can still see the pollution of some mines uh, back, to the, back to the Roman Empire. So guess what we're leaving to the next uh, generations in a couple of hundreds of years or thousands of, thousands of, thousands of years, sorry. So that's just you know, a way to, to go in a direction. At some point, we've got to turn all these words into pictures. Pictures what makes people, you know, change their mind. And we need this picture that you've been showing even more actually to actually get a sense of what we're really doing and the real impact of our lives. Okay, thank you, Guillaume. Um, maybe a question for you three, uh, because we are, we're talking about resources and the impact of resources. And um, yeah, our ideology of the capitalism is a strong ideology and we are living in it. And so what do you think? Can we bring together ecology with the idea of infinite growth? What do you think? That's, that's impossible. Okay. That, that's a nonsense. <laughs> I, I fully agree with that. Uh, there's a, a distinction uh, that I like by uh, French physicist called, uh, called uh, José Alois, and um, he speaks of um, living technologies against uh, zombie technologies. And he explains that, uh, um, well, living technologies were basically uh, built on renewables, uh, but not with the problems we have right now, because of course, as Guillaume has uh, showed us in his books, um, renewables right now need some uh, 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 or to be built, and, and of course, resources that are not renewables. But in the past, at least, uh, living technologies used uh, renewables mainly, um, and they were parts of geochemical uh, cycles, and, and so they did not exist for too long as waste, for example. And the technologies we're using right now, including digital technologies, but not just the digital technologies, are technologies that are built on stocks, on, on resources that are not renewable, that actually do not uh, function for a very long time uh, due to plant obsolescence or plane obsolescence. And at the same time, that uh, leave in the form of waste for a very, very long time, whence the name zombie technologies. Uh, they cannot die, you know, they just stay in the ground, they just build up as a geological strata. Um, and, and, and whether we find them useful uh, whether we can diminish their, you know, uh, carbon footprint, uh, whether we can make them more efficient, whatever, um, they will remain zombie technologies because it's an essential part of what they are. We cannot make them something else. So uh, uh, we are producing these zombie technologies and we cannot ex expect to have some sort of way out of that uh, that would be good, that will, you know, solve all our uh, problems. Hmm. Frederic, you are still there and um, when we uh, were preparing this panel 
you talk about that we are at the moment in the middle of a rock concert. I really like that metaphor. Um, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I try to be optimistic uh, all the time. So uh, what is your idea like about um, how can we go back to the rock concert uh, before the crisis to make it a real rock concert as a metaphor for our future and our planet? Yes, I remember my metaphor. I think I was saying that because of the lockdown at the moment, uh, <laughs> There is this strange energy that we can't actually, you know, use. We we want to change things, and we are all completely alone in our <laughs> in our flats and trying to discuss and exchange ideas beautifully, like today. But this really feels like being in a rock concert and just sitting with masks. Um, so I think that was the the, the metaphor. Um, but um, I I mean, trying to be optimistic, it's I'm afraid it will be a very banal answer linked to the fact that when you have big, big turmoil and big crisis, there is always a chance that things um, will will change uh, for 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 good. And and I I quite like the the way I mean I very much like the way in which actually Bruno Latour has has turned this whole pandemic situation. Uh, which is a, a where to lend after where to lend. Um, the, 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 the fact that actually the idea that this pandemic situation, and many people say that, it just intensifies the, the everything. It intensifies our problems, but it also intens intensifies our feeling that we absolutely need to change. And exactly what uh, Alexandre was saying as well. Um, so, um, it also intensifies the way in which we can experiment, like slowing down, looking around us, making new alliances. Um, I'm afraid this is still very abstract, but at, at the moment I'm preparing a, a new play with, with Bruno and, and it's all about experimenting, um, uh, ex experimenting in this strange confinement which is actually our world, you know, we are confined <laughs> in the critical zone and we need to learn to move and to inhabit that. And in a way, we need to rediscover this strange space that we, we have forgotten a little by being in this fiction of the, of the globe. So yes, trying to be optimistic in such a dark time is difficult, but it's, of course, uh, um, believing in, 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 in the power of, you know, of, of our imagination, obviously, but it's also the idea that, um, as, as Guillaume was saying, you know, the apocalypse is not uh, completely here. It's very close, but it's not completely here. So there's, that's just a, a very little bit of time to, to, to go. That's mm. what I, I could try to say. And it's, in a way, it's <laughs> It's it's a paradox. Like we have to hurry, but we have to be slow to rethink and do the the like the good steps and not just running. But the interesting thing, Frederick, with what you said, uh, jumping on on this coronavirus thing, is that what was unthinkable is happening. Mm -hmm. And before that, uh, some things happened on U.S. politics, on the European agenda for the last three, four years, which were unthinkable. Brexit, Trump, and it's happening. And I think if someone who has been, uh, you know, uh, very ill for the last uh, three years, uh, you know, almost, uh, how do you call that in French, in, in English, dans le coma, how do you say dans le coma? You know, dark, uh, deep uh, sleep out of the hospital and would suddenly wake up and say, what happened for the last three, last, last three years? And we would have to explain this person what happened for the last three years. He would say, that's not possible. And it's happening. And a coma, okay, thank you. And uh, the th I think it's interesting because it brings us a flexibility of thinking that maybe we didn't have before. We are more resilient. We in Paris, I believe, are very much resilient today, much more than we were five or 10 years ago because we've been having for the last five, 10 years, tourist attacks, fires on Notre Dame and all these kind of things. And I think that makes us more resilient. And I think that's interesting with this crisis that I wasn't thinkable is, is, is happening and we are ready for 
you know, going through, hope not, but we are psychologically more strong for actually uh, experiencing and going through other uh, challenges that will come ahead because we are prepared, more prepared for that than we have ever been in our generation, I guess. And I think that's a good thing with this crisis, I guess. It makes us stronger and even more able to make our imagination work because uh, if we don't, uh, the world will imagine something for us uh, at our place. Thank you, Guillaume. Um, now I um, like to ask my co-moderator, Barbara Kjolvasa. It's 6.15, we are perfectly in time. Can we open up uh, the round table for the Q&A from yes. public? With pleasure, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, first of all, merci Frédéric, Guillaume, et Alexandre and Sabine for this lovely discussion that was um, uh, really inspiring. And merci also to the telegrammers for uh, the ongoing discussion that was uh, uh, in, in, yeah, next, that was happening next to this discussion on telegram. Um, there was one question that uh, I thought was kind of uh, provocative. Um, it was, do you think that predicting the end of the world creates the kind of media spectacle that actually prevents and distracts us from any real change? So maybe that goes back to the rock concert uh, uh, metaphor, which actually now that I think of it reminds me of Plato's uh, um, Höhengleichnis. I don't know what it's called in English, but uh, anyway, the question was about distraction. Sorry. But, you know, expect the worst and hope for the best. That's exactly what is being said. And yes, you have to expect the worst. And, uh, and that's because you expect the worst scenarios that actually you can get over them. That's called resilience. But you need to have people to think about this. Cassandre was right. Uh, the Greek, uh, the Greek um, mythology uh, lady was right. I, I agree with that, um, um, but I, I think it's interesting because you can see the, the question in two ways. Um, predicting the worst is absolutely necessary, as um, Clive Hamilton said five years ago, or ten years ago already, in his uh, amazing book *Requiem for a Species*. *Requiem pour une espèce*. You have you have to lose all hope. So in a way, it's absolutely necessary in order to act. But there's another, an, another way to answer the question, and it's about entertainment and Plato's cave, which is that um, there is a taste for the apocalypse. There is a taste, a strange one, a dark one for catastrophe. And, and, and of course, we should be careful because there is this fascination for destruction, which is almost... Um, uh, um, uh, ecological pornography, <laughs> I could say. And, and this is indeed very dangerous um, in itself because it, it, it can indeed uh, uh, stop us from um, making the right steps. I, sorry, sorry, Alexandre, uh, I, because I wanted to point this out into your direction because there was another question on the Telegram chat. They were very concerned with conspiracy theories. And I think that links very well uh, to what you just said, Frédéric. So the question, the, there was a whole discussion on Telegram about conspiracy theories. How do we, how to deal with them? And I wanted to point that into your direction, Alexandre. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I can, I can answer with a follow-up of what has been just said because it, it's um, intimately linked. Um, I think the, 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 the question of the, the spectacle uh, the Borgian spectacle and about the, the, the end of the world uh, is a, a legitimate uh, question. Um, but at the same time, we should understand that going back to the uh, collapsologist movement in France, which I will not defend on all accounts, that's not, that's not my, my issue, that's not my problem. But what was um, notable, what was interesting is that um, actually it brought a lot of people who were not accustomed to these questions, not from you know the ecological movement or uh, eco-socialist movements or whatever, uh, people we generally like in those settings that we are right now. Uh, it brought people who were you know separated from those arenas, uh, people who were engineers, people who were CEOs, and other other kind of people 
who, um, because it was a very technical discourse, uh, you know, you can say it's religious, but at the same time, it was very, very technical, um, uh, pushing forward uh, uh, discourses, scientific discourses, uh, scientific state of the arts. It brought uh, audiences which were not, you know, as I said, again, accustomed to dealing with those issues. It became, they became concerned by these issues. And of course, they don't share the same reactions we would expect from people who have another political background. But at the same time, I think that's part of um, staying with the trouble. You know, these people who are concerned by this problem are not like we would like them to be uh, nice eco-socialist people, uh, but we have to deal with that. And I guess that, that's the same with the, um, uh, uh, how would I say, with the conspiracy uh, theory. Uh, those discourses happen. And I see uh, researchers um, that I would not have expected to fall for, for these discourses completely falling for these discourses. I see people in the collapse movement falling for these discourses. So it, it fractures a society along lines we were not accustomed to which is of course very interesting and, and also um, requires that we understand why we were weakened enough to fall for these conspiracy theories. Uh, this is where I will maybe take a different stance from Guillaume, meaning that uh, we can say that what happens to us makes us stronger in a kind of Nietzschean sense, you know, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I, I think it's not always the case. What doesn't kill you often makes you weaker and, 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 and currently the crisis, there are a lot of people who are weakened from a, 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 a mental health perspective, social perspective uh, with regards to the living conditions. Uh, and so we have to, to, to deal with that. Of course, resilience is a concept that is trying to, you know, benefit, have us benefit from the issues that we are facing, encountering. But I, I think it's a, it's a very contested uh, notion, this notion of resilience. I won't, don't want to discuss it right now, but I think we could have an entire discussion on that topic. topic, that topic, topic. I like the idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of ecological photography. That's a very interesting one, because the end of the world could be a beautiful end of the world. Uh, the, the, the atomic bomb is kind of striking and somehow beautiful. And uh, seeing these uh, huge fires, mega fires in Australia or Brazil or California is somehow beautiful. And as journalists, I do video, I do documentaries, and you want to show what is tracking for the people's interests and what is tracking is impressive images. And that is a really big question. Uh, I, I just finished a documentary which is being aired on Arte, even in, in Germany. And we filmed with a drone places completely destroyed by rare metals exploitation. And that was freaking beautiful. And that was a question with my co-documentary maker to say, how can we show something which is obviously horrible, but at the same time beautiful, which is very aesthetic. Isn't, it a, isn't there a moral issue here, uh, an ethical issue to be, to be questioned? What do I do as a journalist, you know, showing something that shouldn't happen, but it, which actually could even be painted or photographed and, 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 and somehow aesthetically beautiful. Uh, how do you convince the people that it should not happen if at the same time they want to see more of that? Yeah, thank you. Alexandre, you want to the, the, the picturesque uh, ruins that we were talking about previously. I think there is a, a whole danger of having two picturesque, uh, aestheticized uh, ruins. But it can be another understanding of ruins as well. All right. Um, I think, I mean, there were some uh, more questions on Telegram um, and also a comment that um, I think is very important to voice out is that obviously here in our panel, we are uh, a very one-sided part of the world trying to talk about the entire world. So mm. um, that's uh, something that of course has to be voiced uh, in this space. Um, and I would like to invite you to afterwards go uh, into the Telegram talk and try to find the other questions that unfortunately couldn't, we couldn't bring up uh, right now because um, yeah, we are at the end of the panel and Sabina, I would, I would like uh, to give the word to you to, to wrap it up. Thank 
thank you, Barbara. <laughs> so yeah, not only time is running, um, time is running, yes, <laughs> but for our planet too. And um, so I think my personal key take today after this exciting insight um, into your thoughts, experiences and wishes for our living space is that changes of perspectives are necessary to design new imaginations. And with Alexandra's word, we have to deal with all kinds of species. I was uh, doing that note as well. Um, yeah, I'm sure festivals like this give us the power to go on with our mission, to stay connected and act together. And yeah, maybe it's in our hands to land in a good future, I hope so. And not only for our grandchildren, we have to act for the many more life forms in this planet and on this planet. So now I wish you an exciting evening with a lot of more great discussion and artistic performances to come. I know it was a yeah quick start into the topic and feel free, Barbara was uh, telling you to go on with your questions uh, in the Telegram chat. The discussion will go on there. Uh, we will be there as well. And um, yeah, now goodbye from the panel Habitat.